Hi guys, Tap here and welcome to our Emancipation Day special. I have a very, very special guest to speak with us today and to also give a very interesting story that a lot of you may not know about. I didn't even know about it. So today I have here with me Dr. Colin Archer, psychotheologian, author, uh, you're also the founder of the Modern Day Methodist Church, and I'm sure the list goes on and on. You just tell the people, what is it that you do? Well, I'm a Methodist minister, basically. Mm -hmm. I was ordained 43 years ago this year. Actually, I was ordained the same, I was ordained in May of uh, 1970, mm -hmm. and this incident with the nerve gas incident happened, happened in, yeah. in uh, August of that year. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had gone through college in Jamaica and UWI for five years leading up to that. So um, I'm a basic Methodist minister who's always had an interest in translating things heavenly, really things heavenly into things earthly, mm -hmm. really, as they say, incarnating the gospel. And so I often spoke even in the earliest days about Jesus, the human life of God with the emphasis on God's humanness rather than God's divinity, the way a lot of people look at things. Definitely. And so that shaped a lot of the things I did in, in, in consequent areas of my life, my understanding of the essence of the gospel. Well, I can tell just by hearing you speak um, that you're definitely, even with your, your business, investing in being human, like you're very invested in, you know, human beings and how we live life and how we operate here, even down to the local level in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the incident, so we're going to talk about that, um, August 1970. So basically what happened is America, our big brothers to the north, wanted to leak or dump, I should say, some nerve gas in Bahamian waters mm -hmm. and you I understand was uh, the lead person or one of the lead persons to prote protest that action of them dumping uh, you know dangerous nerve gas in our water so I want to know take us back 1970 this is before independence mm -hmm. so take us back to that to that time and explain how you know okay you're a young man you find out uh, this is what's going on in your country. What is your initial reaction or respond to it and the general reaction of young persons like yourself at the time? Well, I, I, I was a member of UNICOM, which is a university and college students. It started several years before this incident, mm -hmm. university and college students, and we always had a social conscience. I came home for really vacation in 1970, and Unicom and some of the people I mentioned, Dr. Bernard Nottage was actually the first president of Unicom. And we, I guess we were all very socially inclined at the time. And around that same time, there was a big hullabaloo about the dumping of nerve gas, nerve gases around the world. And there was this particular incident in between August 15th and 18th, the dumping, it was actually a sinking of an old Army Navy ship mm -hmm. with some it's believed between 2,700 tons of nerve gas and 670 tons, depending on who you read. And nobody actually knows any way how much nerve gas was dumped. It was planning to, it was worldwide, known all over the world, or certainly in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Florida, they did a court suit to try and stop the dumping, but it failed. I must have come home at a time when this was very much in the news. At its height. Yeah. At its height. And a, a large part of this dumping was off Florida and 150 miles off the island of Abaco in what is called the, the Bahama Bank, 16,000 feet of ocean. And a number of us felt that uh, you have to realize at that time too it was very much black power and mm -hmm. <laughs> all that sort of stuff. You know, we were very socially, more socially aware than yeah, politically aware. Yeah, because I noticed aware. you said, you know, I, as soon as you said it, it clicked in my head, you know, yeah. you were off to school. Uh, Bernard Nottage, a, um, a, a lot of other different people mentioned in the article. Sean McQueenie, McQueenie um, Alison Maynard. Maynard. And it's so funny because it's like now, 
like I'm off to school of myself. And when a lot of people, we come home, it's like, you're not really in that mind frame. It's kind of like, oh, well, come home, enjoy, go out to the nightclubs or whatever, and go back, go back to the States. Like, I kind of get this attitude where it's like, anyway, I'm not coming back home. Like a lot of people kind of have that mindset now. Where it's like, well, I'm not coming back home. I come home to have fun, party, whatever happens in the Bahamas now. Well, too bad. But you guys were in a different mindset. Actually, that was a part of Unicom's preamble mm -hmm. that when we come on vacation it's not just going to be vacation I, mm -hmm. I talk about the beginnings of Unicom by Franklin Wilson he gave a talk to um, the Chamber of Commerce a couple of years ago and he said Unicom that came out of Unicall the whole purpose of Unicom and college and university students was that when they came home on vacation it was not just going to be lazing around on the beach mm -hmm. but we would get we would be involved in some community activity and some trying to, to fight for some community cause. That, that, that it's exactly the opposite to yeah, my college. It's, it's, it's Kids totally see it today. Now. I yeah. mean, you know, it wasn't just, it was hanging out with a cause, if you wish, yeah. and with a purpose. These days it's senior frogs and jello shots. Yeah, no right. one's really, <laughs> no one's really trying to come together. So for we anything. got together the Southern Recreation Ground mm -hmm. that Sunday night as it was going on. This incident happened Tuesday, the 18th of August, mm -hmm. 1970. So we had to move real quick. We got to get together. So, so you guys just, it's so hard for me to grasp with you guys as young people. You, there wasn't a, like an older person that said, okay, you guys need to do this. This was your own kind of inspiration well, and motivation. Yeah. At, at 28, that's mm -hmm. why I say in this paper that I did, I was a kind of tangential ringleader mm -hmm. yeah, of sorts because I was, Canon William, Tom, Archdeacon William Thompson, who's now dead, he certainly was a part of the organization that night. The park is now named, as you know, after him, yes. Archdeacon William Thompson Park. But he was there helping to draw up the placards and decide the strategy. The American Council, it was then, was on the Churchill Building on Bay Street. So we said, we'll target the American Council and Britain, mm -hmm. and of course, Government House represented Britain at the time. There was not a governor general, there was a governor there at the time mm -hmm. who literally, we were still a British colony. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm trying to make. So people wonder why protest in front of government house. This is pre-independence, three years before independence in 73. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of activity in the air about, you know, well, we want to, see, we want to play like we were independent, I suppose. Mm -hmm. We want to assume the role. And so this was an opportunity to defend our country, our shore and, and so on. And we got together on those two nights. I remember well the Monday and the two, uh, the, the Sunday and the Monday night, the recreation ground. You know, getting really all excited and and saying we'll hit down on Bay Street. And there's a story there by Larry Smith and others reporting this. We had international reporters, the Guardian, the Tribune, and others were there. And we hit the street on Tuesday, the 18th, the very day the nerve gas was being dumped. Mm -hmm. And the Florida, Claude Cook, who was the governor of Florida, they had lost their case. And so they, the ship was just waiting to go down. The case was lost on the 18th, and the ship went down with all those chemical weapons, um, chemical and biological uh, agents. And we now know one of the canisters with VX gas. And anybody who knows what VX gas, if you Google VX mm -hmm. gas, you'll probably be surprised. So, um, and, and in fact, the Florida court said afterward, had they known there was a canister of VX gas, they probably would not have uh, allowed this sinking to go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so the protest was against the British government who, uh, who represented us Bahamians in a pre-independent Bahamas and the US government that did the actual uh, dumping of nerve gas. And of course, you know, I've written a very extensive paper about the a vast amount of nerve gas, chemical and biological weapons that were dumped beginning in World War I and ending up to that very day, August the 18th, 1970, after the protest. And the Americans came out with a statement that said, as of this day, we will not do that anymore. So it, and so, it, I don't know if it's coincidental or just <laughs> happened. I, I think it was really getting now worldwide right. interest. Before that, they were just dumping, presumably indiscriminately, for years and years. And mm -hmm. you, one could say billions of, or millions of tons of, of nerve gas all over the place. 
A great part of the dumping was off the Florida coast, as I say in my mm -hmm. paper, North and South Carolina, Florida coast, and the Bahamas. I was gonna say- Beginning from World War I. Up to that day, I was gonna say, do you feel like you guys protesting may have been like the nail in the coffin who or like and that's or coincidence? That's the curious thing, yeah. and that, who knows? We can only say in the month of August, uh, 1970, it's on the record, there's a congressional report to 2007, they said the Americans ceased of that from that day to dump in these lethal substances. Well, that leads me to a question, because and I think... I don't know if the egg came before the... Oh, the chicken or, or the... Chicken, <laughs> I don't who knows. But that leads me to an inter uh, interesting question, because I feel like, you know, as a young person living in the Bahamas to date, I think sometimes people get discouraged or afraid because they feel like you know you know if we stand up against this if we protest maybe it 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 won't get the desired result we want but i want to know in your opinion is it still important to do so would it still be important it, let's say you guys protested that last day and they still did not stop leaking the gas like to, like, would it still be important to let your voice be heard regardless of the outcome? It is important. As you know, you use a different medium today. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I call my thing a feet on the street. Mm -hmm. That probably, you know, the 1% the, the other day in the States, that was a big thing, people out there. But in social media, tap what you do. I mean, you're one of the well-known bloggers mm -hmm. and social media people. You probably touch a lot more people <laughs> you know, but how do you register that? Then you can ever imagine, you know, through through electronic media. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it seems easier to do it your way through social media than to actually get out there on the street. You know, I, I was looking at an interview the other day by a, a famous British writer, Carl Phillips, uh, Western who's gone to the States, he's been interviewed. He said, it's a thing that strikes him about the States today, that you don't have more public protests about things that really matter, the poor, women's issues, mm -hmm. abuse, and so on. You don't have more. Now we're seeing it now with the Trayvon Martin, Martin thing. Case, yeah. So it probably takes something that really energizes people. But again, as you know, social media but just about is, got all with, that going. With social media, even with you mentioning that, you would think that us having social media, it definitely, I would say, it makes us more connected because you can literally reach anyone and know what's going on. But I feel like in a way, it's made us kind of lazy too because what mm -hmm. happens is, particularly in the Bahamas, this is what I'll notice. Let's say you have uh, something gruesome happen, like, like the Marco Archer uh, uh, situation. And what will happen is, um, I think social media, it makes people detached in a way, like you kind of numb yourself because people, they'll get outraged, they'll go on social media, you know, kind of beat up your gums kind of a bit and then that's it. I feel like there's still a need and importance for us to follow in you guys' footsteps and actually get out there and take it to the next level, not just post a Facebook status and kick your feet back up and go to your house and live your life comfortably and just like, oh well. That is that's affect true, me. and that's true. And but you all, you know, the older you are, the more, the less likely you'll do that. <laughs> and you know, even in the protests in, in August 1970, you notice how young those, <laughs> I guess you can say, kids. Kids, yeah. At, on the Southern Recreation Ground, as we plan, we got all this pla placards. If it's so <laughs> done, I would safe. Know. You keep it, and all those things. But when it ended up. There were only the kids, my brother, Robert, who was 12 years old, Allison Maynard, who was 13. But I want to know, what did the parents say? Did the parents, were they like, you guys well, not going out there? Like, you know, it's Bud Abbott and Luca Stella, you know, follow me. And then he pushes him first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe they push the kids, say, not me, you go first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was quite, frankly, honestly surprised that some of the older folk, that is my age, mm -hmm. uh, I know Cannon, Archdeacon Thompson didn't turn up. That that threw me a little bit off. I felt, you know, my buddy isn't here with me. Mm -hmm. And so I really did end, but I was always interiorly oriented. I don't need <laughs> a lot of people around me to decide what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. But really, it, these were preteens. A lot of them ended up, there were the Lionel Careys and the Sean McQueenies and who were older. But then again, Campbell Clare was at the age 19, the, the lawyer Campbell Clare, I think the 
uh, Sean McQueenie, I think, was 18 or so. Lionel Carey was 27. But they were really relatively young people. But when we actually planned the event, the two days before, they were the older people planning the event. Mm -hmm. But literally, you know, some of them were preteens. And they had some of the most insightful statements when they were actually interviewed on the street. Again, as you'll see in my extensive paper, what my brother said, what Allison, young Allison Thompson, there was a teacher there, um, uh, a day to school teacher, Sherry Minns. She was there at the age of 25. But it, it's only to say that I guess it takes a, an enormous amount of courage to do this. And the older people are generally the first ones to slip out. But as you point out too, even our, your younger generation seem to have little cold feet.